Uh, I'll leave these with you, okay, for people who. Uh, before we start, uh, someone last, it might have been you, somebody last week was asking about, um, they, they had seen a liturgy for the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. Was, was that you? I was telling you that there's an Assumption Day. They celebrate a day. Yeah, so yeah. Well, so here, here's the dope on that. And I only bring it up because it's an example of how you can have an evolution in Christian doctrine over centuries. And suddenly something that wasn't before is now present. And I'm thinking, of course, could be Matthew 25. But in the middle of the 19th century, this, this is the way typically this gets dealt with in a, in a university classroom. In the middle of the 19th century, uh, Pius IX was a, a very strong pope. And it was sort of uh, the heyday of uh, Catholic power. And uh, the whole area of Italy through the middle where Rome is, was uh, separated from Northern and Southern Italy. And the Catholics were feeling their oats. And so in the middle of the 19th century, at an important uh, council, they declared that the Virgin Mary was born without sin. And this is called the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. So that was, uh, I mean, of course, they didn't say we just made this up this century. They said, well, people have always thought this. So now we are simply defining it as the, the truth. So that was something. Then in the middle of the 20th century, I think maybe 1954, they declared that not only was the Virgin Mary born sinless, but when she died, she didn't actually get buried. She ascended into heaven the way Jesus had. And so that was another, so Protestants, they, they really squirmed there, like, what? Without any evidence or anything. Yeah, can you, can you just change this stuff as you go along? Because this is a pretty big deal. On the other hand, you could say it didn't really affect anything else that Christians believe, other than how significant the Virgin Mary is to Catholic piety. And uh, all of the recent popes, including the present pope, who's something of a liberal, uh, all of the recent popes were big uh, Virgin Mary enthusiasts. They uh, made a big deal of petitioning, praying to the Virgin Mary and so forth. And Protestants just kind of waved their head, like, really? <laughs> uh, like, Protestants didn't really care that much. But <clears throat> it could be that Lutherans, Luther, Luther was quite reverential towards the Virgin Mary, whereas other Protestants weren't. So in my own family life, when I hear reverence to the Virgin Mary, or even prayers, you know, like put in a good word for me with Jesus, it doesn't affect me. My wife goes nuts. Uh, she was raised as an evangelical, where there was no sympathy for what's called Marian piety. In fact, they think it's apostate to do that, right? They think it's <laughs> contrary. Yeah. So anyway, that's that. Um, I mentioned that because uh, a point I uh, emphasized last time, and even the first two times I taught this class, is that people can make new discoveries of things that had been maybe latent in the history of the church or in the Bible all along. So Luther, in effect, rehabilitated St. Paul 
I mean, Galatians and Romans had always been in the New Testament since the first century, but Luther made them the center of the New Testament. So that just shows that Catholics never quite bought that. Uh, and that just shows how somebody can have a tremendously powerful experience and they go with it and they change the history of Christianity by the way they do that. Um, we think that major scenes have always been around forever. Not really. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi in the 12th century was the first, so far as we know, to set up manger scenes in every village in his area of Italy. And it sometimes said that he sort of brought Jesus down to earth and made uh, village piety, not just the church, but village piety, the center of Christian uh, attention. So that was a big deal. We can't remember today that there was ever a time when manger scenes weren't a big deal, but they've only been a big deal since the 12th century and so forth. And monasteries have only been a big deal since the sixth century when St. Benedict kind of invented them. So things can change and people can be so convicted by something that they start a new, a new religious movement. And new religious movement is actually a term used in the sociology of religion to describe not just of Christianity, to describe that could be Moonies, uh, Mormons. Uh, so anytime a movement sort of comes along, like out of nowhere, sociologists always jump in and find that as another new religious movement to study. And um, when I was at Berkeley in the 70s, doing my PhD, uh, we sort of looked around and said, wow, it, it seems to be a fertile ground. So this is the San Francisco Bay Area. It seems to be a fertile ground for new religious movements. And so they got a big, maybe I said this last week, they got a big Ford Foundation grant and six of us volunteered to study. So like there was something called Earhart Seminar and so forth. And uh, so people were studying these and, and Buddhism around Big Sur were, was, was another big deal. So anyway. you can start something new. So in week two, I went out of my way to imagine that some people would say, well, is this just a flash in the pan? Is this just an outlier? Like one person decided that Matthew 25 was a big deal and no one else thought so. And I, uh, as I was writing my book on this, which is now coming out in the fall, uh, I tried to anticipate that a lot of people, including maybe a lot of Lutherans, um, if it should happen, maybe George would lead the assault, lead, I shouldn't say assault, lead the rah-rah. Uh, if it should happen that I would stay uh, decided to take up the question of whether we should become a Matthew 25 congregation, just the way 10 years ago or so, we became a reconciling in Christ congregation, meaning we were LGBTQ friendly. And I could imagine, uh, let's say this church is full and the church council is putting forth something to vote on, whether we should become a Matthew 25 congregation. I could well imagine people say, well, wait, how, how many people, how many people are in Matthew 25? One, 10, a hundred, a thousand? How many of them are Lutheran? 
one, two, three. And so it could become a reason why you'd say, well, it's a nice idea, but it's, it's a flash in the pan. And uh, I say in my book, could you imagine the day? So everybody knows that football games, uh, especially the biggest football game of the year, there are often people in the stands who hold up John 316 signs. And that means every American watching television, which is millions of people, is looking at John 316. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And all Christians today think of John 316 as something you'd, you'd put on a poster. And everybody would say, oh, that's cool. And of course, we all know that verse and so forth. And so I fantasize, could it ever be the case that people would hold up Matthew 25 signs at a football game? And it seems to me that that's maybe a long way in the distance. So my dream is that one church in Washington, you guys, one church in Chico, California, my home church when I'm in California, might lead the way and become a Matthew 25 congregation. And maybe it would start to take off. And then when I get discouraged and think, no, yeah, nobody's really gonna be that interested. It's not that people are against it. They just, you know, it's in the Bible. But really, are you, are you saying it's, it's that big a deal? And then I happened to come across this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was maybe on Facebook, or I can't remember where I saw it, maybe a Christian blog, that the Presbyterian Church is leading the way and was saying, hey, uh, what churches out there are willing to get on this bandwagon? You know, we're trying to get something going here with the National Presbyterian Church. So it could be that if in the next couple decades, Matthew 25 churches become a thing, maybe it will have been Presbyterians that led the way. And then uh, about a year ago, I discovered that the uh, Southwest Synod, the Southwest California Synod in the ELCA, whoa, Lutherans, um, they weren't quite at the point of designating Matthew 25 congregations, but they were using Matthew 25 as a tag for social ministries. So like here, if you have Backpack for Kids, which is a kind of an outreach ministry, maybe we would say, oh, here's our Matthew 25 uh, Backpack for Kids movement. Or we now have, I think, a trailer on the property and let's say we started to get two or three trailers on the property, maybe for, for people who otherwise would have no place to park their trailers and have no other place to live. And maybe we would say, oh, that's the Matthew 25 trailer movement. See, there, you, you can't predict necessarily how that tag is going to be used. Um, about six months ago, I sent a check to Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. It's a national movement in the ELCA. Well, you could say, oh yeah, this is the Matthew 25 refugee movement. And you, so you see, so that's what the ELCA in Southern California is experimenting with. Whether when you have social ministry, which this church is quite good at, you would simply tag them Matthew 25 ministries, and uh, wouldn't be bad, wouldn't be, wouldn't be bad. Um, the most famous so-called Anabaptist group uh, as an offshoot of American evangelicalism, it's called Sojourners, and it was founded by a guy named Jim Wallace 50 years ago came out of the Jesus movement. And he likes to say, I don't think he means this literally, but he likes to say 
Matthew 25 was my conversion story. He didn't really, he doesn't, I think, mean that he wasn't a Christian before that. But he means that as a young Christian, Matthew 25 became his awakening, his great awakening. The way Luther, who's struggling with, can we have a gracious God, or are we always going to feel under judgment? And Luther is in the monastery, and he's uh, working on his classes that he teaches at the University of Wittenberg. And he's tremendous struggle. He's He's um, kind of sad and down and everything. And when he discovers Paul in Galatians and Romans, it's an awakening experience for him. And so uh, maybe there'll be people across the United States, including some Lutherans, who uh, have such an awakening experience. Then when I tried to anticipate, yeah, but aren't people going to say, it's an outlier. I mean, a lot of people don't even, haven't even heard of it. They don't even know which verses, oh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. But they don't even, they, they never even knew which verses. I'm not sure 10 years ago, I, I knew which verses. And I sort of know Matthew pretty well, but I don't know if I knew it was Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And that it was part of all those uh, end times story. But in anticipation of that uh, resistance, uh, I wrote a couple chapters arguing that in fact, Matthew 25 is a perfect fit in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, as I said last Sunday, is obsessed with widows, orphans, and migrants. They're obsessed with them. And the prophets condemn Israel, ancient Israel, if they don't come out and respond to these groups of people. And uh, Catholics came in the uh, 1960s to call this God's preferential option for the poor. That wouldn't, it, it, that, 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 that phrase sort of stayed in Latin America. It just doesn't easily roll off the tongue of Americans. Because if somebody said, if Biden uh, said, uh, the poor are God's favorite people, that'd be it, he'd, he'd lose the next election. The poor are God's favorite people. Really, everybody knows the middle class or possibly <laughs> millionaires are God's favorite people. And the way we know they're God's favorite people is because they're so rich. And so if you start saying the poor are God's favorite people, who would, who would buy that? Uh, so you'd have to sort of dress it up a little bit or kind of nuance it. Or in my case, I uh, found about 50 verses in the Old Testament that unmistakably say the poor are God's favorite people. And then a lot of stories by Jesus. Jesus' famous story about the banquet. A rich uh, uh, guy, God, presumably, is giving a banquet and nobody comes. And so God says, well, then fine. I'll go out and invite the people to the banquet that nobody would have invited to the banquet. And they are, and so they are often called substitute guests. If I can't get the wealthy in the middle class to come to my banquet, I'm going out into the highways and byways and the poor are gonna become the starring people at my banquet. And other people are gonna say, what? You give a banquet and all you can think of coming is poor people? Was that a flop? It'd be like uh, after the next presidential election. Uh, there's a big presidential um, party, an inauguration party. And we assume that all the millionaires who gave billions to the election would be invited. But what if you only invited poor people 
What if you said to the Salvation Army, if you got a list of uh, poor people that would like to come to a presidential banquet, well, send me the list and that's who we're going to invite. It would never happen because all the people who paid for the election, all the people who bought the president and the senators and the House and the representatives, they would think, wait a minute, we own this political process. Surely poor people don't own it. They didn't give any money to it. And if they did, what was it, a dollar? So there, there would be this really dramatic thing if, if, if this ever happened. So the timing might be good. The poor people's campaign march on Washington. Yes. Saturday. Yes. So they'll be live. Yes. Yes. DC. And I, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're really serious about this, you should look at the experience of the uh, Christian nationalist movement and how they manipulated uh, uh, dominionism and prosperity gospel to exactly the opposite. Yeah. 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 I mean, it does show whether we're talking about the left or the right, that new movements do happen. And sometimes with pretty outrageous claims and they're uh, somewhat successful. I read uh, a clever comment last week that uh, people are worried that maybe uh, Trump's followers are deserting him or that or that Trump is deserting them. And the person said, you don't get it. They are Trump. So the, so Trump is not an outlier. And then he's got all these millions of people that it would be nice if they would cheer him on. They are Trump. That's why he's so successful. And so um, impregnable, uh, you, you can't sort of, even the January 6th hearings, who knows whether they'll lay a glove on Trump or not. But if they do, there's going to be millions of Americans, including possibly 80% of evangelical Christians. That was the Trump vote in the last election. 80% went for Trump, uh, which is an astonishing uh, number. So now I want to pivot during on, on this week towards can you get from if, if, if we too said we should um, embody in the way we worship and preach and teach, we should embody these Matthew 25 concerns. Um, most people would buy that. Although now I, this, I, I just thought of this as I was driving into church this morning. So this could be a little controversial. So hold on to your seats. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was thinking about the fact that the people who write the prayers that we sing, that we say during the general prayers, the, the common prayers, it's my understanding that uh, Seth doesn't write them and the ELCA doesn't mail them out, but that there's a committee that is assigned to write these prayers. And these prayers are often very much Matthew 25 kind of prayers. Not just Matthew 25, but like, so when Jesus did Matthew 25, he didn't mention the environment. You know, he didn't mention flooding and heating climate and stuff. No, nobody knew about that in the first century, but now we know about it. And so on, on almost any given Sunday, there'll be mentioned in the prayers of the church, a uh, concern with uh, the environment and you know how things are going in Washington and so forth. Well, anyway, and I don't have um, independent verification of this, some of you may know more than I, because I'm only here six months a year. But I heard that some people thought these prayers were getting too political. Um, and they went to Seth and said, um, these prayers are getting too political. They're sounding like 
Democrat prayers, not Republican prayers. And surely you must know that there are all kinds of people in this parish, not just liberal Democrats. And so according to what I heard, but I was in California at the time, that Seth went to some of the prayer writers and say, said, couldn't you make these a little more neutral, a little less conspicuously liberal concerns? That's all I know. I don't know, like, was it about the environment, but, you know, climate change, because many conservatives don't believe in climate change. And so if every Sunday you're a conservative and you're sitting here and there's several sentences in the prayers about climate change, it might start to irritate you. And so you might say, uh, well, you know, how come we don't have any Republican prayers? Who would that be? <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. Well, what, if, you, if, if there were such a thing as a Republican prayer, what would it be? Lord, give us the strength to push people back across the border in Texas. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't quite feature such a prayer. And maybe nobody would just come out and pray it. Uh, a Republican running for office this past week said that Putin, no, not Putin, worse, Hitler. Hitler was his ideal person. And why was that? Because Hitler stood up for national pride. I mean, okay, there was that Jewish issue, but <laughs> apart from the Holocaust, Hitler stood up for national pride. And how come we don't hear Biden or maybe even many of the Republicans stand up for national pride? And my country right or wrong? And we are God's favorite country. And another thing that people like about Putin and Hitler is that they're both anti-gay. And some people, anti-gay. Um, so for instance, uh, someone gave a speech last week in which they said, here's what I love about Putin, three, three things. One, He's, uh, he didn't used to, he used to be an unbeliever, but now he crosses himself. Um, so one thing about Putin is he's a conspicuous Russian Orthodox Christian. Two, he hates gays. So that was considered good. So in other words, and, and, he, and he's a white supremacist. And third, to enforce these views, he was willing to go to war. So what more could you ask? <laughs> He's a Russian Orthodox Christian. He hates gays and he goes to war. So why couldn't we have uh, a person like that running for president? We did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of bizarre, but I'm not making this up. If you... Uh, read the news and or listen to the news, you, you know that this is happening. Now, obviously in this church, if someone said, well, let's put some of that stuff in the prayers of the church every Sunday, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. I mean, Seth surely would veto it, or maybe the church council would veto it, or maybe the social, uh, social ministry committee would veto it. But it just goes to show that there are things that we pray for and there are things that we don't pray for, or maybe we even pray against them. Uh, it wouldn't be unusual for a Lutheran prayer to pray for immigrants and against the rejection and persecution uh, of immigrants. That, that would fly in uh, most Lutheran churches. Not sure about the Missouri Synod. I grew up in the Missouri Synod, but I'm not sort of connected to it much anymore. 
And um, I don't know what would happen there. They're far more conservative than the ELCA. But I guess what I'm saying is the kinds of things you pray for, the kinds of things that would come up in a, uh, a class like this, or the kind of things that Seth would preach about aren't accidental. They come out of, I presume, deeply held beliefs, but maybe not everybody would hold those deeply held beliefs. So now I, I want to pivot to um, Martin Luther King, because what I'm posing in this last week of the class is whether Christians, Lutheran Christians, should, um, is it okay if I sit? Yeah. I, is it okay? Yeah, I yeah. Or would it be better if I sat there and put this down there? That would be fine. Whatever. Okay, okay. Let's see if we get it. Okay. Um, so, if a pastor, like Zach, or previous pastors, or future pastors, um, became politically active, um, they were out there marching. Like if it was still the 60s and 70s, and there were great worker strikes more in California. So when I was a young pastor in the um, late 60s, there was a march for great workers in California. And I joined that march. And it was just my first year in the ministry. And um, we were marching downtown in the East Bay. And a member of the church did a double take and she said, Pastor, what are you doing here? She wasn't mad. She was startled. She might even have been pro-farmers union, great workers union, but it was a new thought that a pastor might be marching in the picket line for the grape strike. And maybe it was the wrong thing for me to do. I mean, I was brand new and um, I don't know, there you go. So we might say, yeah, it's good to be politically active. And uh, if George is um, marching and uh, working on homeless issues or running uh, a movement in favor of uh, housing immigrants, maybe from Ukraine these days, uh, probably many of us would think, well, that's cool. Then if George wore a sign while he was doing this that said, Agnes Day Lutheran Church, we might not think that was cool because what about people who are anti-immigrant? Don't we have any of those in this church? And if we do, do we want George wearing a sign, uh, you know, a name tag that says um, August Day Lutheran Church? I just came back from the Synod of uh, Sierra Nevada Synod in ELCA in California, Northern California. Mm -hmm. And we all wore signs, and my sign said, Donald Hines, Faith Lutheran Church, Chico. So I brought that sign home and sitting on my desk now. So I thought to myself, is there ever an occasion when I want to use this sign again or should I throw it away? Well, when would I use it? I could work to church every Sunday, just like some of you are wearing name tags. So that would be uncontroversial. It's just like saying I'm a member of this church. 
my sign says so. But what if I wore such a thing, Don Hines, Faith Lutheran Church, while campaigning for um, city council, for city council, or for the uh, U.S. Congress person from our area? Um, would, would people be cool with that? So then, this doesn't answer it. The fact that Martin Luther King does something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. But you have to consider Martin Luther King's birthday is a national holiday. Like, is that a miracle? Because Martin Luther King was, um, you'd have to say, a tremendous liberal. And for our purposes here, what Martin Luther King was, a person who didn't make a distinction between what he preached on a Sunday morning and what marches he was leading Monday through Saturday. He, he thought those were one and the same. And famously, he once said, uh, when I get killed, and I'm expecting somebody's going to kill me. When I get killed and there's a funeral, I'd like you to say he died for garbage workers, which was the march he was involved in in Memphis. He died. He, he, he gave his life for garbage workers. Now, you know, we wouldn't expect Seth to say that. Of course, Seth is pretty young. But um, if Seth were an old man, or those of us who are retired clergy were old buggers. Um, would we want to say he died for garbage workers? Or he died so that uh, poor people could be have adequate housing, medical care, food? And um, when I first thought about this a year ago, it struck me that Martin Luther King Whatever you think about him, it, it's almost like it was an accident that we made his, his birthday a national holiday. It's like, really? Did, did we actually do that? But it's, it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Don't, don't we get off on Martin Luther King Day? I think so, yeah. And, and so was it just the right thing? Was this, or was this maybe a democratic gift to the black community? Um, that we're also feeling bad, feeling so bad about this Christian martyr. So let's make his birthday a holiday. And there's and, Martin Luther King Boulevards in every major city. Yeah, like yeah. Like Washington Boulevard. Yeah, who, who, who would have thought? Yeah, and the, the, the street that runs in front of um, St. Anthony, St. Joseph's Hospital in, in Tacoma, Martin Luther King Boulevard. So that's almost like, when you think about it, it's almost a miracle. Yeah. But however, there were objections. Yes. To the declaration of holiday. Yes. I think Arizona assisted. Yeah. For many years. Yeah, it's one thing to name a street, but to uh, to make it a holiday, and maybe it wouldn't happen today. It's not being next Monday with Juneteenth as a national. Yeah, holiday. that's right. So Ju Juneteenth, the, 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 the story that most of us only just learned a couple of years ago, that a couple, well after the end of the Civil War, word sort of reached Texas that uh, Abraham Lincoln had the, the Emancipation Proclamation. And it was unbelievable. Everybody jumping up and down and uh, people sort of sharing this news that this was an official government uh, declaration. Um, but when you think about it, so now Lyndon Johnson would have said, and, and Lyndon Johnson did a lot of things that Martin Luther King approved of, like the Great Society and uh, help for poor people, which Lyndon Johnson correctly predicted the Democrats would lose the South. They did lose the South and they have never regained it because of Lyndon Johnson's quote, liberalism or his soft heartedness for black people. Um, 
But who, but then Martin Luther King went too far in a very famous speech at uh, the biggest Protestant church in Manhattan. He gave an anti-war speech and Lyndon Johnson was heavily invested in Vietnam. He, like Nixon, he famously didn't want to be the first president to lose a war. And it looked like we were maybe going to lose it. And uh, that was sort of the end of the cordial relationship between Martin Luther King and Lyndon Johnson, uh, because King did the unforgivable. And notice how that, that, that just came naturally to King. He didn't say, well, I'm doing this because I'm a liberal. No, he said, I'm doing it because I'm a Christian. Now, I'm not saying he was right. Um, I mean, if you absolutely oppose all violence, then do you have to oppose Ukraine? Should Ukraine have just rolled over when Russia invaded and, and so forth? So these are complicated issues. It's not like we're going to solve them this morning. But that Martin Luther King made social justice and the gospel the same thing. It didn't mean that he denied other parts, that you have to have faith in Christ or that Christ died for our sins and rose again. It didn't mean that Martin Luther King didn't believe those things. He wasn't that kind of a liberal. He was a conservative Christian in that he believed all the very things that Lutherans believe in. Uh, it wasn't like, well, Jesus you know, wasn't really the son of God. Jesus wasn't really divine. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. No, no, King was not that kind of a liberal. He was a conservative. He believed everything Lutherans believed in terms of the New Testament. What he also did that would be a hard sell maybe for Lutherans is that he thought that if, we, if you believe all this stuff, then social justice has to come along with it. The Jesus who died for your sins is the Jesus who told the Matthew 25 story. He was explicitly a God. He was a God, follower of God. Yes, that's right. So that's another thing about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King didn't say the way maybe a Missouri Synod Lutheran would say, well, we've got nothing to learn. Gandhi's a Hindu. Why would we think Christians would have anything to learn from Gandhi? But Gandhi was a non-violent resistor. Gandhi was non-violent activist for justice for the poor uh, in India, even more than in the United States, there are fixed classes of people. And the Dalit, D-A-L-I-T, was the sort of permanent poor class. And that was the people that Gandhi stood with and for. And uh, that made him unpopular in India among some people in India, the same way Martin Luther King or Cesar Chavez in California, he's also gets his birthday as a holiday, but I think in no other state. In the street. In the street in LA, Cesar Chavez Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so these, the, the reason I'm doing so, yeah. I was gonna say one thing. So inclusion rather than judgment. Uh -huh. and unfortunately, I think a lot of our social movements today speak judgment. You're with us or you're a problem. Yes, that's right. And he did not talk that way. That's he right. Talked, he talked about inclusion so that the masses felt like they could join if they wanted. Yeah, that's right. I, I, and are you referring now to Gandhi or King? I'm talking about both of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, King was very big on, you might say, loving people into being just. He never thought that the way to do it was to make it, put a target on rich people and say, we hate them. Or even put a target on the middle class. We hate you guys. He never did, he avoided, maybe partly under the influence of Gandhi, or how about Jesus, partly under the influence of Jesus, but um, 
many people would say that so-called woke people today, you know, we liberals, uh, we're always condemning people. And so the reason we don't get a hearing from white supremacists is because every day of our life we say we hate you. We hate white supremacists. And, uh, we, and, and we hate men. Um, you know, toxic, toxic masculinity. See, if you go around and do it, see, the king wouldn't have said toxic masculinity because he said, what am I going to lose all the men? I have to reach the men, not condemn them. And uh, that is a very, that's a very good point to, have made, to be made that he really believed in the power of Jesus' love and that that was the only way you were going to gather everybody together. Uh, I remember when this church, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we decided to be an LGBTQ friendly church, there were, um, there were at least two families who quit. Um, and they, they were quite upstanding, active. They weren't outliers. They were sort of outstanding, active members. And um, people grieved. Like, is, is there a way we could have been gay friendly without making these people leave? And um, the, I, I'm not telling a secret here. The present president of the congregation used to belong to um, Chapel Hill. And when the Presbyterians decided to go anti-gay, he and his wife left. And they looked around and they said, I understand he looks good. And they joined us. And now he's an usher. He's the president of the congregation. He's this, he's that. But you, you wonder, what, was there no way that Chapel Hill Presbyterian Church, and they've now left the National Presbyterian Church as well, and, and joined uh, a cutoff group that are comfortably anti-gay and maybe pro this and anti that and, and so forth. That happens. It just it just happens in church life. But that you could um, maybe the people who thought we our, our prayers were sounding a little too much like liberal Democrats and not enough like Republicans. Maybe they were really saying, hey, make room, save room, save room for us. You know, we don't want to sound like we're just only giving democratic prayers. But then this, this is where it becomes ticklish for the pastor. What if a prayer is the right prayer to be praying given God's call for social justice? but it sounds democratic. What if that happens? Should we stop praying it? I mean, these are tricky. I don't mean to imply these are all simple things. Just take my word for it and, and do it. These are um, tricky things. And um, I, I thought this past week <clears throat> after last Sunday, that maybe there weren't any real conservatives in the audience last Sunday, because everybody sounded kind of liberal. Um, and so, and maybe that's even true today. So is that good or bad? Well, maybe it's bad, because are, are we not reaching these people? Have we not found a way to, to reach them? Uh, or even maybe worse, is, uh, is this class going to become known? Could it become known as, oh, that's, that's the liberal class. That's the, the liberal Democrats are what that class is about. So why would we, you know, we still go to it. We still like this church and the sermons are cool but uh, we're not gonna go to that class because that class does all this liberal stuff. Does that ever worry you guys?
Um, it hasn't at this point. So. Okay. Yeah. But that could mean only that you haven't thought of it. Um, no, there's been some thought to it. Okay. It, it, there hasn't been opposition. Yeah. You know, to, to drive yeah. in a different direction. Yeah. And it's not always focused on that. So yeah. There's a lot of other uh, lessons and things yeah. to be learned that don't yeah. associate with a particular yeah. line of Okay. Views, so. Good. But is the line of social justice in itself political? Yeah, I mean, is it inescapably political? Can you talk about social justice? I, I quoted this thing uh, last Sunday by uh, a conservative evangelical, probably a Trumper, uh, who released this statement that we need to stop using the word social justice because it's just communist and it has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And tens of thousands of other Protestant ministers signed on to that statement. Just the word, social justice. Just the word. In fact, the word social is suspicious. As soon as you hear the word social, you know they're commies. <laughs> they're, 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 well, you know, we, we laugh at that. No disrespect. We laugh at that. The fact is, we as human beings use communication to talk and spread ideas. And if the word social in this society means something, yeah, we are we when we say social justice, in my opinion, yeah. are twisting the common use of that word. So we shouldn't laugh at them. We should ask ourselves, are we accurately communicating what the message we very have well said? Maybe we should read that word, and I won't use that word because I know that there's many people yeah. who believe social goes to social. Yeah, I don't believe that. But I'm yeah. sensitive yeah. to the language that I'm talking to try to bring that conversation. Yeah. yeah. So while I agree with that, that uh, uh, but at some level, I'm concerned that there are people who are seeking to uh, manipulate the language of the society as a way of driving their political agenda. Yeah. You know? And and by vilifying the terms like social. Yeah. Which has existed a lot longer than yeah. any of these yeah. attributions of meaning to it, uh, is, is really a propaganda exercise. Yeah. And, and you fail to acknowledge that what is happening in very conservative Christian churches is the uh, deliberate uh, establishment of a set of ideologies that they're seeking to. Uh, imposed throughout the rest of society. Yeah, yeah. And they do that through manipulation of the language. Yeah, it's like, it's like you're, you're, you're both right, because really we are contesting a word. It's not that the non justice people are the biblical people and the justice people, the social justice people, are really closet commies. No, we're both contesting. Does the Bible call us to justice or doesn't it? And we probably, we here, probably aren't going to be willing. We might look for another word. Like, is there, couldn't you find a word that doesn't make me see red? Um, but we might also, we might also want to say to the conservative evangelicals, the fact that you want to forbid, forbid the use of the word justice and exclude it from the total Christian message in the world, we, we can't let you do that because you are, you are carving out of, uh, so Thomas Jefferson, just to wander off for a second, you may know the story of Thomas Jefferson, so he was an enlightenment figure and he wasn't necessarily anti-God, but sort of. But uh, he produced a version of the Bible in which he took his pen knife and cut out all the verses he couldn't deal with. <laughs> so he couldn't, he couldn't deal with Jesus' miracles. He cut them out. Now, he wasn't about social justice, but maybe a, a modern Tom, Thomas Jefferson we take all the verses in the Old Testament about widows. I'm so sick of widows, orphans, and immigrants. I'm simply taking them out. And we actually know that in the, during the Civil War, some plantation owners who thought it would be cool 
if their slaves became Christian, produced a slave's Bible and they cut the book of Exodus out of it. Because Exodus, wait a minute, isn't Exodus when God leads his people out of slavery in Egypt across the Red Sea and into the promised land? Well, we can't have slaves reading that kind of stuff in the Bible. And it's often said by scholars that slaves who got a hold of the book of Exodus decoded it. And they said, wait a minute, what are the implications here? Aren't we sinning against the book of, do you guys realize, what, do you think it's just kind of a spiritual spiritual life? Or did God actually call, use Moses to call people out of oppression and free them? Isn't that what this is really saying? And if that's what it's really saying, have, we, have you stopped saying it? Are you not willing to say it? And see if, if this were today and people said, yeah, we really, you know, let's just maybe not cut it out, but let's just not preach on Exodus anymore. No, you don't get to do that. It's there. So recognizing that the Southern Baptist Convention was established as a propaganda yes. to justify slavery. Yeah. That, that is precisely what's happened. Having grown up in yeah. that environment. And the Southern Baptists, now, now these days, the, the, bad, the bad press from the Southern Baptists is that they're sort of rivaling Catholics in molesting young people. And I would have been. Who, who would have thought the Southern Baptists were going to go that way? But I mean, it's a national scandal. Is breaking up the is breaking up the Southern Baptist Convention, and people I thought no no only Catholic priests pray on uh, young pretty boys, uh, but maybe the Southern Baptists prayed on young pretty girls, who knows? But um, so final final point I'm going over because we started late. The final point which you can read about in this section. Do, you, do we ever want to, and at the top of that page two, I talk about what would be some of the reasons that we would go careful and not too far. And so one of them we've already been talked about, what if there are con convinced Republicans in the congregation who start to say, you know, this is, this is sounding too much like the Democratic platform. How would we go about saying, yeah, but once in a while, the Democrats must get something right. <laughs> and that maybe their democratic platform is kind of Christian. So then we're gonna to have to stick up for that. Forget the fact that it's the democratic platform, just say it's the Christian platform. But the, uh, the, 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 these notes that I've given you close by saying, do we really, so, so let's say George's social ministry committee and, and this class. Do we ever want to get to the point where we, the Martin Luther King point, where we say, it's not just enough to do all this stuff in church. We got to be out there. We've got to be campaigning. We've got to set up meetings with um, non-Christian atheists, critics of capitalism who teach at UW. We, 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 we got to occasionally invite them to speak, not because they're atheists, or maybe not even just because they're at UW, but because they seem to have a keen ear for the sins of certain kinds of economic systems. Do we need to go that far or should we stay away? Like, what does it mean to say, so for instance, Anabaptists, were so convinced that you have to separate yourself that they, they wouldn't vote. Today they vote, Mennonites. But then they didn't vote. Well, Lutherans have never thought we shouldn't vote because voting compromises you and you can't be as pure a Christian as you'd like to be. No, voting could be an extension um, of, of your um, Christian viewpoints. So the... Uh, uh... Black churches have sold us to the polls. Yeah, yeah. Because they know where their bacon is being. Yeah. And, and probably more than any white church. Uh, they're preaching. They're preaching it. And they're saying, you know, you, you people's well-being 
as black people who deserve justice in this country. It's being settled. It won't be settled by my Sunday sermons. It's going to be settled at the polls, as is gun control. Uh, and it's going to be settled by people who become politically active. So you could say, I'm just partly kidding here. It's a sin if you're not politically active. And Luther came close to that. Like, aren't we trying to develop a new kind of society? Well, if so, then we're going to have to be, get out there and live in that society. We got to live on the streets. See, the Catholic tradition had been, well, if you're really that big a deal about it, join a monastery. And so Luther developed famously, so did John Calvin, the, the, this idea of the Christian secular calling. It's not just that you're called to be a monk. It's okay, but you perhaps are being called out of the monastery onto the streets. And that's where you need to sort of act like monks. That's where you need to be conspicuous representatives of Christian values. Okay, so nice to be with you. Uh, Take care. You know. Thank you. Should I leave?